people sometimes ask of all the evil out there in the world. People willing to kill in order to maintain their power and wealth. How can you sit here with your eyes closed? And there are two answers to that. One is we're not just sitting here with our eyes closed. We're training the minds. When you understand that, then the other response is, how can you not sit here and train your mind? Given all the bad examples out there in the world, all the dangers out there in the world, where else are you going to find the strength to maintain your virtue, to keep your goodness alive? The nourishment that keeps your goodness alive has to come from within. It's something that has to be independent of whether other people are good or bad. Otherwise, your virtue is not dependable. And that's one of the scariest things there is in the world, to realize that you can't depend on your goodness, you can't depend that you will always be kind and compassionate. If the mind's food source is outside, there will always come a point where when you feel that your food source is threatened, you're going to fight back. When your happiness depends on things outside, it's not only that your happiness can be threatened from outside, but your goodness can be threatened from within. Your determination not to harm anyone, not to engage in violence. will run, run up against some lines that you've drawn. You know, as long as this isn't threatened, I'm okay. If this that's, gets threatened, okay, then there's a big problem. But if your happiness space is within, it's secure. Then your goodness is secure. And that's important. Because what do we have as our treasures in life? It's our own actions. The material things that we use, the relationships that we have, those are not really ours. We use them for a while, we take care of them for a while, and then we get separated. All things fabricated, all things conditioned are inconstant. They're stressful not self. You have to think long and hard about that. And then realize that the only way to respond to that is to try to find something of solid worth inside. And that has to be your top priority. so that you can find a goodness that's unassailable. Something that's truly dependable, that nobody else can touch. Once you've got that, then you're safe. You can trust yourself as you go into the world and deal with untrustworthy situations, untrustworthy people, knowing that they can't touch what's really valuable inside. The world needs more people like this. If the Buddha had waited until the world was straightened out before he was going to go for awakening, he never would have gotten there. You try to work for awakening in the midst of an imperfect world. You're as generous as you can be, you're as virtuous as you can be, both because it's good for the world and it's because it's good for you. You spread goodwill to all beings without thinking about whether they deserve your goodwill or not, because you need your goodwill. You need your goodwill for all beings, because that's the beginning in learning how to be trustworthy in your dealings with everybody.
people good or bad. If there are people out there that you think don't deserve good treatment, don't deserve your goodwill, you're going to treat them ill, and that becomes your karma, your lack of skill. Some people believe that you have goodwill for other people because everybody has Buddha nature, as if only Buddhas were deserving of your goodwill. But if you realize that anybody out there is going to be subjected to your actions, you want to make sure that that impact that you have on that person is harmless. Only then are you safe. This is why all the Buddhist teachings are considered to be protections, and they're part of our refuge to protect us from ourselves, from our own lack of skill. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, not in hopes that they're going to come down and save us, but because they're good examples. You think of the example that they set, and all the hardships that the Buddha went through in order to find awakening. and the standards of the drama that he left behind. There's that famous simile of the two-handled saw. Buddha said if bandits were to capture you and pin you down and to saw off your limbs with a two-handled saw, he said anyone who would think ill of those bandits, direct ill will towards them, would not be doing my teaching, he said. It's an extreme example, but it's meant to stick in your mind. So that when other people say harsh things or do harsh things to, to you or to people you love or to people that you feel sympathy for, you can't wish ill to those people because you realize they're, they're creating a lot of bad karma for themselves. This is a part of compassion. When you see people who are creating the causes for suffering, got to have compassion for them, even if they haven't started suffering yet from that. It's an extension of goodwill. Now, the four Brahma-viharas, the sublime attitudes, basically come down to two. There's goodwill and then there's equanimity. And then goodwill gets applied. When you see people are suffering or creating the causes for suffering, you feel compassion for them. When people are happy or creating the causes for happiness, goodwill means that you rejoice in their happiness or in their, the wisdom of their actions. You appreciate what they're doing or what they're experiencing. And that's goodwill applied. And then there's equanimity when you realize there are certain things that are beyond your control, either because of that person's past karma or your past karma, people for whom you wish well, but they keep on doing unskillful things or they're suffering in ways that you can't stop. You have to have equanimity there so that you don't waste your time trying to change things that you can't change, that you can focus your time and energy on areas when you can make a difference. So this is one of the reasons why we have that chat on the four Brahma Viharas every evening for our meditation to remind us of what our motivation is in the practice. But we need those attitudes, both to help immediately in the course of the meditation and to carry into our daily life, to protect ourselves from our own unskillful impulses, our own unskillful intentions. so that we can become our own refuge. In other words, when you've internalized the, the example of the Buddha and the Dhamma, it becomes part of your daily behavior, in your thoughts and your words and your deeds. There will come a point where you touch the deathless. And from that point on, you become a refuge for others. Again, you can't save them from their unskillful behavior, but you become an example for them. You're part of the Sangha, refuge or the gem of the Sangha. 
So this practice of sitting here with your eyes closed, training your mind, is not a selfish thing. It's protection for yourself, or so that you eventually become a refuge for others. Because we can't wait until the world gets straightened out before we straighten out our own minds, because the cause is in the mind. The world out there is the, the realm of effects. And if you want other people to change their behavior, you've got to straighten out your behavior. You have to walk your talk so that your talk is compelling. And then again, you can't force other people to follow your example, but at least there is that example here in the world. It's good to have these examples in the world. Otherwise, the world would be a totally depressing place. So as you remain true to the practice, you learn the truth of the practice. That's what's special about the Dharma. Unless you're true, you can't find the truth of the Dharma. And then you can embody that truth in your actions, in your words, in your thoughts. Then it becomes a kind of protection. There's a passage in the canon where King Basanity comes to see the Buddha. Basanity is an interesting character. He starts out totally clueless, but he gains faith in the Buddha, begins spending time with the Buddha, and starts thinking about the Dharma on his own. He comes to the Buddha every now and then. He reports, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I've realized x, 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 whatever the issue is. There's one point where he has been sitting in a court case. That was what kings did back in those days. They didn't have judges. The kings were the judges. He said he'd been sitting on a court case where people who were wealthy and had everything they should need are still willing to lie and cheat and kill in order to get more wealth. And he said, I'm sick and tired of this human race. People never have a sense of enough. And Buddha said, yeah, that's the way it is. You will never get people to the point where they have a sense of enough unless they start looking elsewhere for their happiness, aside from material things. There's another point where he says, you know, people who spend all their time building up armies, they don't really protect themselves. If they're still acting on greed, anger, and delusion, they leave themselves wide open for suffering. And the Buddha says, yeah, that's right. Armies are not a protection. Your good karma is your protection. Your good thoughts, your good words, your good deeds, those are your protection. Protection against yourself, your own unskillful habits, and protection against the unskillful habits of other people. So as you meditate, you're creating protection, protection for yourself, protection for the world. The best protection that a human being can do and create. So don't, let ever, don't ever let yourself be swayed from this practice. <laughs>